Hi guys, welcome to RT Dollar Lectures and today I want to be focusing on the section of thermal physics which comes from section B of your syllabus. Now one of the first things that we're going to start off in thermal physics is looking at the concept of temperature. What do you mean by temperature? Now, temperature is, in Lehman's term, how hot or how cool something is, right? And it is, it is a quantitative measure of heat energy. Now, when you talk about temperature, it is measured by an instrument, which is called the thermometer. And there are two units for temperature. Degree Celsius, which of course is measurable using a thermometer, and the SI unit, which is the Kelvin. Now, temperature will basically dictate how heat is flowing. Heat is a form of energy, and it goes from a body of higher temperature all the way to lower temperature. Now, the greater the temperature difference, the faster heat will flow. Now, when we talk about uh, when we talk about temperature, right? We are talking about uh, uh, thermometers, right? And one of the main instruments when we talk about thermometers is your liquid and glass thermometer. So you will have your typical liquid in glass thermometer. And uh, what this does is that it uses something called a thermometric property. Now, a thermometric property is any physical property which varies linearly with temperature. So, when we talk about a liquid in glass, if you recall how a liquid in glass works, is that you have an outer glass tube, you have a bulb which has a very thin glass wall, and it is filled with either mercury or it is filled with alcohol and you have a very narrow bore right so when heat is absorbed it causes the liquid to rise in the bore right and then remember you have <coughs> outer calibrations so you are able to determine what the reading is directly so the thermometric property is the variation of the liquid in the column which is the length of the liquid and hence its volume because remember this we are looking at it in one dimension here but in reality this column is actually a cylinder so it would have a certain cross-sectional area a so once the liquid has risen through some length l you can determine the volume of the liquid which is area by length Okay. Now, when we talk about um, thermometers, you have other types of thermometers. So before we get into more depth back at the liquid and glass, I kind of want to touch on these types of thermometers. So you would have a resistance, you would have a thermocouple, and you would have something called a constant volume in gas thermometer. Now, resistance thermometer uses the thermometric property resistance. Your thermocouple uses a variation of EMF or voltage. And your constant volume in gas uses a change in pressure. So all of these have physical properties, guys, that can vary with temperature. And that is categorized as a thermometric property. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about thermometric properties, I want you guys to, let's go back to the liquid and glass thermometer, right? And we are going to do the thermocouple in detail because those two are required by your syllabus, right? So when we talk about a liquid and glass thermometer, we are talking about a lab thermometer and we are talking about a clinical thermometer, right? So here you have your liquid and you can use either mercury or you could use alcohol. So let's talk a little bit about the liquid first. Now mercury has a melting point of I minus 39 degrees and it goes up to 357 degrees. 
alcohol goes from minus 115 to 78. Now, when you look at those ranges, mercury allows you to measure very high temperatures, while alcohol allows you to measure very low temperatures because of their respective boiling and melting points. Now, these liquids are called thermometric liquids because obviously they have a large linear expansivity, which is a fancy way of saying they expand real plenty when they absorb a small amount of heat. And you would appreciate that because the purpose of the thermometer is to get an accurate measurement of length. So you would want a liquid that that expands relatively instantaneously and at a good rate once that heat energy is absorbed. Now these liquids are encased in a very thin walled bulb and the bulb as you know it's a rounded base and it is inserted in whatever substance you want to measure the temperature of. So the heat is absorbed very quickly through the thin wall bulb. Right now, the liquid will rise in the bulb, right, and it rises to some length here, right. And the narrow bore that is what this inner tube is representing it's, of course, cylindrical, and we call it narrow because it allows the quick ascension of the liquid. And as the liquid has risen, it would correspond to a certain height where you would get your temperature value. Now, the outer casing is thicker, the glass is thicker than the bulb because you want to kind of reduce heat loss. And it tends to be calibrated with the markings so you can directly read the temperature value. Now, liquid and glass thermometers are advantageous because they give a very quick direct reading. However, if you are looking for a value less than, let's say, a 1 degree change in temperature, it's advisable to use perhaps a platinum resistance thermometer, which is a type of resistance thermometer, or a thermocouple. Right, because these do not, uh, that is liquid and glass thermometers are not very specific to small changes in temperature. Now, when we talk about calibrating, let's talk a little bit about calibrating a liquid and glass thermometer. So how do we calibrate a liquid and glass thermometer? The first thing is we have to get our fixed points. And this is a question that comes a lot at the CXC level. So you have your lower and you have your upper fixed point, right? Now, right. So when we get your lower fixed point, you have to know the definition. So I just put an FP for fixed point. It is the temperature of pure melting ice. And remember things like impurities, uh, they affect your boiling point and melting point, right? And that, of course, is zero degrees Celsius. Then you have your upper fixed point, right? Now, what your upper fixed point represents is your temperature of steam above boiling water, right? So, what you will find is that that upper fixed point is actually 100 degrees Celsius and your lower fixed point is zero. So, when you take your thermometer, you place the bulb of it in ice, and you get your LFP, lower fixed point. And then you take the same thermometer, right? And you place it in steam above boiling water, right? And you get your upper fixed point. Now, when you have gotten these two values, you find the length and you divide it into a hundred equal divisions. And this is basically how you calibrate it in the centigrade scale. Now, a centigrade scale means 100 divisions. So once you have fully established what the lower fixed point is and what the upper fixed point is, you measure that length and you divide it into 100 equal divisions. Okay? All right. So uh, let's move on now to the clinical thermometer. Now, the clinical thermometer is a type of liquid and glass thermometer, and there are two main differences. Many times the exam may be structured, so you are asked, okay, so what is 
what is the difference between a clinical thermometer and a liquid and glass thermometer? So the first difference is the range of values. Because it specifically measures body temperature, its range is on either side of body temperature. And the second thing is there is a constriction. Now because, right, this is an indentation above the bore, above the bulb, sorry, to prevent the backflow of liquid into the bulb. Right? So here, if you have your bulb, right? I'm just gonna do it a little horizontal. It's no biggie, so I could just show you. So here you have this indentation. So what happens here is this is a constriction and as liquid or heat is absorbed by the bulb, the liquid has to force its way to rise past the constriction before it could rise off the tube. The purpose of this is that if the liquid, because remember it's you're looking at when you're taking body temperature, <clears throat> very small changes, right? So you're looking at something like a uh, like a point one, because remember, if you're expanding the scale from 35 to 42, a fever you would just basically get like a point something increase. So it's very easy to drop or, or lose heat to not accurately measure that very small change in temperature. So what we find is that tiny little change here is prevented from that is the liquid is prevented from flowing back, so that tiny change can be monitored, right? And that is in essence how the constriction works. Okay, now here when we talk about um, when we talk about temperature, I had mentioned earlier that all of these measure it in degrees Celsius. So the challenge becomes, well, how do I convert from degrees Celsius to Kelvin? So you typically add two seventy three. So if you add twenty degrees Celsius and you add two seventy three, that is what you get as two ninety three Kelvin. Right, And in the same way, if you want to go from, let's say, 293 Kelvin all the way to degrees Celsius, you minus 273. So it's 293 minus 273, which is 20 degrees Celsius. So you're probably saying, but Miss, well, how did you come up with this value? We are going to base this on the absolute zero or the absolute scale. Now, ideal gases work according to the thermodynamic scale of temperature, which is the Kelvin scale. Now, normally, all thermometers that I have described above work according to something called the empirical scale of temperature. These depend on a physical property varying linearly or continuously with temperature, which is how we get the basis of uh, like resistance thermometers, liquid and glass, etc., which are volume. And, you know, that is in essence how they are calibrated and how they function. But you can consider the Kelvin scale to not depend on any physical property, but to actually work on something called the triple point of water, which is 273.16. And it is based on an entirely different variation of temperature, right? And it's not dependent on any physical property. And it's a theoretical scale, which is how you are able to convert your measured values into these Kelvin SI unit values. Okay? Now, the Kelvin scale is based on the properties of an ideal gas. And the lowest temperature in your Kelvin scale is called absolute zero. So, absolute zero is, of course, zero Kelvin, right? And it is the lowest temperature which corresponds to the volume of a gas being zero and the pressure of a gas being zero. So if I were to do, a, let's say, an experiment, right? And uh, I am doing it in degrees Celsius, right? Now, it's going to be kind of difficult, challenging, to get a temperature where volume is zero, right? If you look at it realistically. So we could do a normal experiment where we monitor the volume of a gas at different temperatures, right? And I'm looking at degrees Celsius temperatures. So let's say I conducted an experiment like that and I plotted my values here. If I wanted to physically or determine, I'm going to extrapolate my line and I'm going to see where my line cuts the x-axis. 
Now, where it cuts the x-axis will correspond to where my volume is zero. And that temperature is minus 273 degrees Celsius. And that is where I have deduced that conversion. So it's not like I'm just telling you something in a vacuum. You have to conceptualize the conversion between the two because at zero Kelvin, that is minus 273 degrees Celsius. Why? Because if you wanted to determine what it is by definition, absolute zero is the temperature where the volume is zero and the temperature is zero. So what you are going to find, the pressure is zero, sorry, not <laughs> temperature, the pressure is zero. So you are going to find if you extend the line, then that corresponds to minus 273. All right, in this video, the last thing I'm going to touch on with respect to this topic is thermal expansion, right? Now, when we talk about thermal expansion, we are talking about uh, uh, matter expanding when heated. So all matter, regardless if we are talking about solid, liquids, or gases, they expand when heated and they cool well they contract when cooled right so expand when heated and they when cooled they contract now many times you will consider in thermal air expansion physical examples so a simple thing like if you want to pop open and this is a common example if you want to pop open a glass bottle right those normal pasta sauce bottles for example you could run the metal cap under hot water and you would realize that the metal cap would expand at a greater rate than the glass bottle so because of that the circumference of that will increase and you're able to pop it off now another example is like in weathering right so when you think about like uh when you think about uh like chemical weathering and physical weathering right that's an example in geography where you have uh where you have uh, like the inner core in the rock being metal in nature and it expands and contracts due to the changes the drastic changes in weather then that could result in a lot of cracks developing right uh you could also think about the concept of railway tracks where you have large gaps in between the railway tracks and what that causes is that it prevents uh, it prevents, you know, breakage. When you think about pipes being S-shaped, that as well as opposed to just being straight, it facilitates contraction and expansion, especially in temperate regions where you have drastic changes in weather and temperature from summer to winter. Now, one of the things I want to touch on is the bimetallic strip, and it's pretty popular when it comes to thermal expansion. Now, the bimetallic strip is used in bells, it's used in a thermostat, and the point of it is that it consists of two metals, let's say copper and iron, Fe, that expand at different rates. Now, copper is a better conductor, and what happens is that when the strip is heated, copper expands more. So, therefore, it's going to cause the strip to bend down. In the same way, if you had the strip, the heat being removed, the strip would return to its original state. So here you have it being heated and then you have the copper contracting more, right? So what happens here is that uh, the, it will bend, I shouldn't say, if the copper expands more, it will cool faster. So it will get shorter faster. So the strip will look like this. It would bend up, right? Because it will get shorter compared to the iron, which is longer. So it would curve up. In both cases, when the heat source is removed, that's it, okay? It will go back to its original state. Now, a thermostat is basically where it's used and you have your bimetallic strip here and it's normally touching an external circuit, right? And the point of it is that it is used to cool a circuit. So let's say like uh, your normal heater, you iron in your clothes. So initially, you would plug it on and it would start to get hot, right? Fine. Now, you would want in your thermostat to regulate temperature. So things like air-conditioned units, your cars, all of these things, all of these circuits aid in regulating temperature. 
now here what i'm going to find is that if it's very hot like it starts to get pretty hot what is going to happen let's consider copper on top iron below your bimetallic strip is going to bend so let me draw the new version of it now so here your strip is going to bend down so what happens is uh, the situation like this where it loses contact here so when that happens it switches off the circuit and if you think about it realistically your heater goes on off on off on off right so when that happens it loses contact here and it switches off heating which is why your heater light blinks so it will go on it will go off now you don't want your heater to cool down totally because then you will it will not function as it should and then you don't want it to get too hot because it could burn all the wires right so again temperature regulation so when it's sufficiently cooled the internal circuit is sufficiently cooled you'll have a situation like this happening now where the by metallic strip rejoins to the contacts and then it switches on the circuit and then when it gets too hot it causes the strip to bend and again you have switching off but the switching off is only for a period of time because you just want to maintain a certain temperature so you don't want it to get either too hot or too cold now if you add a control knob at the bottom like different settings what you do is you add pressure on your bimetallic strip so by screwing it down or turning it up or you're just controlling the temperature at which the bimetallic strip is going to bend right and that will control uh, the temperature settings in your device